Well, welcome to another episode of Blood, Sweat and Deers with Service UK. I know, much anticipated. We haven't done one for a while, have we? we no. We started off with the best will to get going again, and we didn't. And it wasn't until we met this person at the deer store. The very you? special guest. The very, very special guest. That is? Doctor. doctor. We haven't had any doctors on. Doctor Al Gabriel. <laughs> Molecular biologist. Um, you're on the Basque Council, I believe. You're the chairman of Basque Deer Stalking uh, Committee. Is that right, Al? Correct. Uh, freelance writer, keen deer stalker, pulsar ambassador, general all round good guy. Welcome to our show and thank you so much for coming and joining us. We really appreciate it. Oh, thanks for having me. I've been looking forward to this for quite some time, actually, since we met. Well, we had a podcast in an aisle at the British Stalking Show. We had <laughs> we half did. an hour, didn't we? And I said, oh, would you come on? That'd be brilliant. Because what, what you were telling us, um, and, and not to cut straight to the meat, but uh, about ticks and Lyme's disease was was just so informative and so interesting for me. Um, so it, welcome to the show. How are you? Uh, I'm alright, busy at work, uh, hence the shirt. I'm not putting the shirt on for you. I'm just multitasking today. You're looking a bit smarter than us. So, uh, this, this is a quieter time. So, uh, you know, for people that perhaps listen to this podcast later on in the year, um, it's early June. Uh, our books are fat and lazy, a little bit like myself at the moment. Um, <laughs> the cover's high, difficult to see. We're not doing that much deer stalking. We can do a bit of recon, go and check on our cameras. I'm saying that we're out tomorrow, but mm-hmm. um, yeah, in general, we catch up on things, maintain our you know, eye seats, kit, stuff like that, catch up on our paperwork, call sheets from last year, etc. That's what we do. So uh, are, are you doing much stalking at the moment, Al? Oh, that's a whole topic on its own. Uh, this is what happens when you're, I'm 40 now, and uh, life gets too busy. So um, my time in the field has been significantly reduced uh, since uh, moving to West Yorkshire. So I used to be based in Northumberland. Yep. So we moved to West Yorkshire about uh, two and a half years ago. And with the house renovations, work, travels, etc., cetera, uh, I'm going to a new cycle of stalking where my time's been severely reduced. I do get out uh, now and then, um, just not as much as I used to, or as much as I would like to. But it's changing soon, I'm sure. I would imagine you get lots of invitations. Um, but where is your stalking based where, where, where if you were going to go out tomorrow pick your rifle up get yourself out do some stalking where would you go uh northumberland i mean northumbrian row is the only thing i've ever stalked as, as a hobby or as a primary interest I, i'm probably one of the only people that would admit i have zero interest in larger deer mm-hmm. at yes. all i mean i've been offered several times i have zero interest in terms of shooting, per se, apart from the biology and the laws, really? wow. etc. Uh, I, I think road deer is just fantastic because it's. Uh, I'm not a big guy, you know. I don't weigh that much, and I don't want to be lugging large, large animals. I don't have the infrastructure to handle such things. So I like the idea that you can uh, manage these animals, carry them yourself. Guests, you know, even young people, women can carry this animal, process it fairly easily. It's just a man, a perfect size for. Uh, and you go through the meat fairly quickly, so you're back out again. You're not yeah. stuck with, you know, a significant amount of venison that you have no, to shift. No, Northumberland's not an area I've, I, I've I've spent much time in at all. You've got the huge, that huge block of forestry that runs up to the Scottish books. Kielder, isn't it? Kielder, Kielder Correct. Planted, yeah. planted back in the 70s. Um, I reckon it was designed by Ronnie Rose, if I can remember rightly, the old Forestry Commission guy. And... Um, it's a massive forest, and I think in the good old days it had about five ranges on it. So that gives you an idea of how how big that forest was. So was your stalking? Um, we've gone off on a bit of a tangent as ever with these podcasts. <laughs> was your stalking woodland? Is because because Northam is quite. You've got a bit of open hill there, stone walls. I'm trying to set the scene in my own head of where you'd be out yeah. about. It's a place time forgot, you know, stone walls and medieval yep. times. So primarily my stock is a clear fell. It's a pine forestry block yes, and a couple yeah. of uh, lowland estates, which are standard um, yes. you know, standard northern villages. Um, but I think uh, there's a couple of papers that have been published uh, about 10 years ago now, I think. Uh, Northumbrian and Cumbrian row are different genetically. Really uh, well. Not all row deer are the same. Um, obviously, as you know, they went extinct uh, 
back in the day, medieval times. Mm -hmm. um, so there's been a lot of introduction from Germany and Scotland. So genetics for the rest of the UK is fairly similar. I think it's from Persia, I think, where they've been introduced in the south. Um, but Cumbria and Northumbrian roe are genetically slightly different. It's the same animal, but it's a variant of some kind. Uh, and I've always, I've, I've always told people that when you come to hunt a Northumbrian roe, it's not just any row, you know, it's a, <laughs> it's a true English classic, you know, it's not a reintroduction. <laughs> it was always there, it would never went extinct. So there's something, uh, and the head will tell you, and anybody who's stalked an all east uh, roe deer, roe buck will tell you, the, the antlers are quite unique, straight up, very skinny, not much body to them at all. Um, uh, you can spot it from a mile away. Uh, an all east roe buck is quite very unique in the way you can identify if you look at these things long enough you can and it's a very small animal the vegetation is quite rough there's not a lot of enough calories and on the ground so you yeah. know a three or four year old animal does not weigh that much compared to a, a you know a roe deer from down south so it's <laughs> physically it's distinctly <laughs> yeah it's light what it's kind light of carcass animal. weights would you expect head and legs off then 15 kilos uh, that's roughly a bit about it, depending on where you are. Although I think yeah. last time I told you, uh, uh, many years ago, I shot one uh, in, a, in a lowland state, granted, and uh, I, I, I undressed it. I, the minute I started dragging it, I realized there was something weird about this animal in terms of how heavy it was. Yeah. I couldn't shift this thing on a harness. Yeah. And only when I got to the ladder do I realize it was 25 kilos fully dressed. Wow. At what the time, mean? I didn't even flinch. I was quite early in the stalking career. I didn't even Head know off what the well. average was. Head off, everything wow. fully dressed, weighed 25 kilos. And the head did not look that impressive either. But at the time, right. I didn't clock on how rare of an opportunity this was to witness yeah. uh, Northern Row at 25 kilos. And I have not come close since then. We uh, had about a, six a, years ago. quite a hefty one last mm. month. It was 21, 21 and a half kilos. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, yeah, you know, normally I was, didn't have to drag it very far, but I think I grabbed hold of its antler to start to pull it out. And it was like, Blinking neck! This is this is this is a good book. This is I mean, it was a mature book for mm, yeah. four or five years old, and uh, and it wasn't until I got it actually back home and hung it on the scales um, that I saw how, how heavy it was, and it, and it had probably dried out for a day as well. So it was probably it probably lost half a kilo drying out, yeah. you know. But it's um, funny you should say you, you drag about the antlers. It's the one thing you can never do with a northern row. It will so shred dark. through your hands. You only learn to do that once. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the purlings are different. I mean, next time you get an opportunity to see, have a look at them. Uh, yeah. The purlings are quite deadly because they are forest animals. Um, yeah, most people tend to pull it once; it will go through your gloves. Um, really? It's not the wow. same when you go down south. The antlers are much smoother, denser. Yes, yeah. it's, it's good, good handle on them. But the northeast row are quite sharp, quite scrawny antlers with sharp endings. Um, that's one thing people realize when they start dragging it by the head. And you only do that once. So your road here are predominantly forestry then, which is sick, be sick, sick as spruce, commercial blocks, living on the grass rides and, and, and what, you know, little becks and burns and everything that tumble through it. No, yeah. no real um, agriculture where you're no. Road here, no. It's, it's, it's mostly uh, sheep and cattle for most parts. Um, you can also tell, obviously, these are forestry animals, even months after the head is prepared. The smell of pine never. Yeah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah it's great, You yeah. can always ID them quite, quite, yeah. And the do you, smell, um, uh, do you, uh, how, how do you encourage your row into places to? Do you put? Have you got mineral licks where you, or anything like that that you use? Uh, no, whatsoever. So the, the management plan is different. Um, obviously, uh, we can't encourage them. We we control them on site, so that we don't have a, a management plan in, in a traditional sense where you improve them for heads, clients, etc. Uh, this is a full-on control phase uh, at all costs. So w w whatever is available during that season is taken out in numbers. Um, and do you know what I mean? We're talking about sometimes six to 8,000 acres of land. Um, the opportunity to learn an individual here and there quite limited yeah, yeah. the number of animals and distance you have to cover so you yeah. really you know in some states uh you know you might get used to one buck for years you no. know and there's I, no I, I, sign I, of any seeker turning up from north of the border coming down or anything. no not as far you do get the odd red from uh, states uh, parks escapes but uh, rarely it's, it's quite a localized environment it's, uh, it's very, one of the harshest environments to stalk deer in um, and I think one of the reasons I invite a lot of people to come stalk with me, and I think one of the things they enjoy and they tell their mates when they go back is, uh, is how rugged Clearfell and how harsh 
of an environment, particularly in winter. It's a real workout and people go home absolutely shattered. But, you know, they have the first brew and they look back on it and it was quite worth it, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So is, so is that predominantly foot stalking there now? It is, uh, completely. Uh, and I'm I'm not uh, a big fan of high seats no. or any sort of structure. So um, I, I try and keep, it's always exciting because because of the large area, you need to move a lot to learn new things about your own ground because it's a large environment mm-hmm. to cover. Yeah. So I think you see more, you learn more. And I think you're making sense as, you know, you're looking at other things, forestry, quality of the trees, ticks, etc. They all come into it. So you need to be mobile to, re- to really learn what's going on. Um, yeah, and those, those you... clear fells soon fill in after a couple of years, don't they? What, the uh, one that absolutely. It was your bank of clear fell for a couple of seasons. Suddenly it's uh, two, three foot high in regeneration and you just can't see it after it is. early spring, can you? So it's, it's, uh, it's tough. And there's yeah. a forestry work that's ongoing. Some areas get cleared and it becomes fairly productive that season. Some areas are very mature and impenetrable in some cases. There are portions of the forest where humans haven't been there for a good three or four years since the last spray. Sure. You know, as <laughs> some areas are that far out that yeah. unless you move around, you really don't see much. And I think it's enjoyable in an environment like that to be on foot and uh, having a bit of a mooch. So we've gone straight gambling off into your deer stalking, <laughs> Northumberland and massive yeah. carcass weights. How did you get into it, Al? I'm, I'm fascinated um, because you are not a typical British deer stalker, are you? You told me before we started you're Ethiopian by birth and uh, you're a British citizen. You're you know you're a doctor. How how, how have you uh, fell into a stereotypical British? field sports I'm, it's so great to see you involved with it and your passion for it and you know when we say when we met the first time um, I was enthused by your passion for how did you get into it um I, I mean this is just a long one actually I mean I, I started shooting uh shotguns at uni uh, over weekends and uh just some organized the city you were living in yeah <laughs> <laughs> exactly um and um uh, progress from there so I joined the TA uh, about 2006 uh, I joined an infantry uh, reconnaissance platoon. Um, I was trained as a rifleman there primarily. Uh, this is the time of, uh, this is when we were in Helmand uh, in Afghanistan where the whole army was mobilized, you know, new weapon systems was coming in um, and we, we were being um, be called in, but essentially we were training for the real thing. You know, I, I trained at the time where, uh, you know, machine guns was coming in, new weapons was coming in, things we need to be prepared for when we went there. I never served, by the way, I never went. Uh, but that's what we were training for. So I came at the time where, you know, anybody who wanted to do rifle training, you know, you were paid for, you can spend up per bright three weeks in a row if you chose to, to, to really get stuck in because we were next to be called in. So any training was available to us, you know. So it was fantastic, you know, off-road training, uh, perfect time for a guy like me at the time. Uh, so we started competing. Um, so they volunteered, you know, does anybody want to shoot for uh, the battalion shooting team? So I put my name forward, um, got selected for it, and we competed for about two years. So I spent a lot of time uh, at Perberite Rangers, um, won a few trophies as a team. Um, and that was my initial real connection with ballistics weapons. And that also brought you into international armies, you know, uh, from the Commonwealth, we competed with everyone. So you'll check out their weapon, service weapon, and they'll come and check your service weapon. It's quite nice to have that level of variation. And don't forget the the ranges are open. All the instructors are ready to go. Whatever you picked was ready to go at your own pace. You know, uh, we're talking about thousands of rounds on a daily basis down range. Um, so I, I now fully appreciate the cost of ammo. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> when you have to pay for it, it's not as fun. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, these were the days where training was really encouraged for, for obvious reasons. Um, and I was trained by one of the, the best shots in the country uh, with real world experience. And uh, it's the kind of training you can't really pay for uh, to be mentored by, you know, the top six, seven uh, military shots in the country to be coached and got all the tips and that sort of thing. And so I've, I feel really, uh, I've been extremely, extremely lucky to, to have had the kind of training that money can't buy. Uh, and, you know, I'm very thankful for the British Army for getting me in the right stead, you know. And also, uh, because it was a reconnaissance uh, company, you know, we had to train a lot on uh, field craft, uh, you know, outdoor stuff, uh, how to approach the enemy, that sort of thing, more than the average. Because when infantry reconnaissance is the tip of... Uh, 
the spear as it were. So we were trained in real stuff, which you can directly apply for deer stalking. You just can't write this stuff. Right. Uh, it, so, so I've been lucky and I'm a trained biologist. So I've, I've come from a mix where uh, I have a biological interest. I, you know, I start with ecology. I, I've, I've even studied a grasshoppers for my last year project. I went to France looking at this chromosome, uh, this chromosome on, a, on a grasshopper and the French-Italian border. So I've, I've had good grounding in the biology of it. And I've, now that I've had military training in a way in terms of shooting, deer stalking is kind of the next step because, you know, you've got good field craft uh, training and, and appreciation for the, the natural world. So that's basically how I, 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 my, interest, where my interest comes from. Uh, so I picked up um, pigeon shooting earlier on, got my license, was helping a few farms, uh, joined a game syndicate. Uh, spent maybe three or four years um, on pheasants and a couple of the guys in the syndicate had the stalking right on that ground so they invited me over um, so on a, on a Saturday morning before the shoot we'll, we'll get in early spend a couple of hours mooching about on rodos and uh, and the shoot will start about eight nine o'clock and sometimes you'll find a, a doe you know, kind of a carcass hanging by the shoot, you know, it's quite nice. Uh, with, with like, <laughs> exactly, because uh, you know, it's it's, it's quite uh, it's part of the bag, you know, the daily yeah. bag. You know, it's it's quite what nice. Next, to con- what 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 part of the country was that in? When you uh, that was near Newcastle, Tiny Weir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, so not far from uh, Northumberland, just literally the next county. Uh, yeah. So it's been that's how I got into it. Essentially, it's uh, initial interest was shotguns into pigeon shooting, game shooting, and being invited by two uh, nice blokes who took me out deer stalking and like i always said the rest is history you know yeah oh fantastic that's yeah. nice to see how you've prog- progressed into that and um and also how you can take your um you know your uh, biologist um background into it and you've really drilled down into it and that's that was one of the reasons i wanted you to come on and have talk mm. to us because um we had a massive chat didn't we about um the tick and lyme's disease which is a Great. bit of a um a speciality of yourself isn't it that's uh, and i learned so much from you about the tick and um I'm, and a lot of the woodlands that we have uh, not so much in oxfordshire but further south um and definitely over in northamptonshire and um, there's a high tick proportion and uh, you kind of knew the areas where they were um so tell us a little bit about ticks and how how you got into that was that something that you already did involved with but bec- or was it because that you were working with deer and uh, you were starting to see them on the carcasses and stuff like that you you, you kind of learned more about yeah so it's um I'm a, it's my personal interest it's just a, it's become a hobby of mine I, i'm massively fascinated by ticks i just mm. don't think they get enough appreciation um <laughs> Uh, which we'll come to in a second. Uh, my first interest is when I was bitten for the first time. Uh, it was the oldest one. I, I never thought it would happen to me, but it did. And that really got me. I was so nervous about it, you know, figuring out about Lyme's disease. Um, and I spent enough time in the field, but I've never, that was the first time I've actually physically clocked it. And that really, it was a cha- it was a, a moment for me to realize that how close you can come to this thing without knowing it. I mean, yeah, people I mean, have to understand, I mean, Lyme is quite rare, you know, three out of a hundred bites will result in it. It's quite fairly rare. The likelihood of you being killed on a motorway is significantly yeah, yeah. higher than yeah, takes. Yeah. So you have to take it with a pinch of salt and you have to keep the perspective. It is still fairly a rare disease, a rare occurrence for the general public. And that's where the conversation ends. That statement applies to the general public, yeah, not yeah. to a deer stalker. No. To a deer stalker, the proportions are significantly different. Yeah. Yeah. If you're going to be handling carcasses, they can't apply the NHS health yeah. guidelines for the average person who lives in Piccadilly Circus in London of <laughs> incoming in contact with ticks. <laughs> or in Beardsmore, we'll, we'll suffer a significant, you know, the amount of ticks you come across on a daily basis yeah. is a thousand folds higher than the person living in London. Absolutely. And yeah. that and that's the problem. People get NHS advice for the average British person living in Birmingham, etc. And well, apply it to... Clapham common. Okay, there you go. <laughs> 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 yeah, you know, that, that 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 that's what happens, and I think uh, getting that distinction right for deer stalkers is difficult. Particularly the younger they are, the more resistant they seem to be. Mm-hmm. Uh, deer stalkers are a different different class in terms of your risk factor for ticks and Lyme versus the average British Joe. Yeah. Um, and particularly if you come from areas like Tetford Forest, uh, west you know west coast of you know, Highlands in Scotland, areas where they're very 
predominant, yes. then that even goes an, a few more folds. Um, yeah. And the, the number, the data is never reported as, I don't know, we currently we get about somewhere between two and 3,000 confirmed Lyme cases a year in the UK. Now, I haven't seen the data to say what the breakdown is, but I can guarantee you there's a significant lot of stalkers in that number. Yes, yeah. yeah. You know, and people are very shy about it, or it's a private matter at the end of the day. It's a health issue. And yes. a lot of people don't talk about it openly. We only get into the stage where, you know, people can talk about it openly with their friends and share their experiences. A few significant, you know, some prominent people in the industry have come forward and put their cases uh, to, to educate, you know, which is important. So I think that's the main take home message. Standard Lyme disease advice does not apply to a day stalker. Yeah. Uh, you're basically in a war zone every time you're out there. That messaging is only to a person who's back home, who isn't facing the enemy. You are facing the enemy on a daily basis. So your risk factor is high. And that's once you tell people that, they, they start switching on and listening to actually, oh, I, I didn't realize I was at that high risk of catching this thing. Um, and ticks are... Uh, I mean, we can go, obviously, we can, we're doing a podcast on it, but we can spend hours on it. But I'm just going to yeah. briefly tell you the errors people, what I hear on the media and sometimes when people talk about it. Um, you have two different types of ticks. Uh, overall, there are about, kind of at the top of my head, but about 800 different species in the whole of the world. There's about 800 different ticks that come in two categories. Uh, we're only going to focus on the sheep or deer tick, which is what we've got primarily on this island. Um, they've had about 100 million years to perfect their weaponry. So when, when I end up in a British forest as an African migrant, right, I am faced with an enemy that's had 100 million years to work this thing out. Okay, I just got there with no preparation, no information whatsoever. And that's the battle we're at. You know, if I'm wearing shorts, etc., I'm in the, you know, trolling through high grass, the risk is higher. Um, so it's, it's a, an enemy that's not fully appreciated and respected. And it's because people don't, even science doesn't fully appreciate um, its complexities. As I was mentioning at, when we met at the stalking show, I'll give you simple examples. Um, ticks don't have heads. A lot of people say, oh, I pulled in, the, the head was stuck, didn't come off. Um, uh, ticks don't have heads. They have mouse parts. Um, and the neurons, the nervous systems on its back. Mm -hmm. And it's not an insect. Uh, ticks are actually spiders. That's a major distinction. People always think of it as an insect. Ticks are not. They are a spider family. Um, and the, the Lyme disease um, is a, what you get from a bacteria called Borealis. It's not, a, it's not a virus. It's a bacteria that lives inside the animal. Uh, so once you make the distinction, I think people start to warm up to it a bit. It's not your standard insect. And spiders are far more complicated in terms of evolution. They're far more acutely aware of the surroundings that insects yeah. are. It depends how you see evolution, but they are far more advanced as they are. Uh, and the first set of legs, if you really zoom onto any tick picture, if you look at the first front legs, you'll see a little blob uh, just about here if you look at tick. And it's called the Horus, Horus organ. Uh, it's a specialist organ that is unique to this particular of ticks, sheep tick that we find in this country. Uh, the other half of this, the second type of ticks don't, don't have it, which complicates our life. Um, and it's a sensory organ, so it's a chemoreceptor. Uh, science to this day, I've checked last time about six months ago, science does not understand how it works. There's a lot of theories on how it works, but scientists don't understand how it works. Um, and that's how ticks really see the world. Uh, that organ does everything. It's eyes, nose, mouth, hearing, all combined into one. So whenever you find tick inside a human skin, it always has that V-shape um, look about it. Uh, it's because the sensory organs are on that end of that V-shape. So although people think the head is buried in, the eyes aren't, and they clearly are aware of what's around. So the reason why you shouldn't mess with the backside with Vaseline, fire, cigarettes, salt. Toothpaste. Uh, toothpaste. It's because they can see it's coming. And and I think that's uh, people aren't fully aware how acutely aware ticks are of the environment and what they're doing. Obviously, they can sense your heartbeat. Uh, the minute you shoot a deer, the deer goes down. The tick is already aware that the thing it was attached to until a minute ago is no longer alive. So the process of finding a new prey is already switched on. It's, a, it's an wow. SOP thing with ticks. Mm -hmm. And guess what? The next thing on the menu is you or your dog. So they're basically yeah. just looking for the next host. Yeah, and they're fully aware of your heartbeat. They can sense it. The minute it stops feeding 
no longer operate. So the you, you uncoiling process. What was interesting, you described it. This is the, the nearest I can explain it to how it works is like the old 80s, 90s film Predator. That's where, basically it. Where he's, That's he's, the closest that, is thing. That really true? Yeah. It, it's really true. It is the closest thing we have. I think people always remember that movie uh, and it makes sense. Uh, I'll tell you another thing as to why it's like um, Predator. I think ticks are genuinely are the predator. There's no distinction in my eyes that that character in actual ticks. So this organ, Holler's organ, um, it smells. Uh, above all, it detects heat. It detects infrared, which is how that guy was doing it. Uh, it's basically your thermal imager. Now, because I want to tell you this accurately, I was working at a bit of maths before this call to give you a proportion of it. Okay. Now, the average tick can detect heat up to four meters from where it is. Now, to, to you and I, four meters does not sound much, right? But you have to understand the size of a tick. It's, we're talking about two millimeters for a nymph up to about four or five, depending on which species, gender, you know, that sort of thing. But in a sex, whichever you want to go. But roughly you're looking at three, four mils. And four meters <laughs> is the equivalent of about 1400 times its body length, right? For you and I, that's roughly about just short of three kilometers away. Wow. Your modern pulsar or any thermal imager that's not military grade roughly goes to about I don't know, one, one and a half kilometers. So a tick can see twice the size of your average thermal imager now for its body size. And that's where it becomes really impressive. How can something that size of two mils is able to pick up four meters away? And that tells you even the sensor is advanced than our equipment. Uh, the best equipment. I, I run a, a pulsar merger, and it's good for about 1,700, 1,800 meters. Yeah. That's that's half the half the length. So, uh, an animal that can see, smell, detect heat, can detect CO2, so it can yeah, detect yeah. the amount of uh, carbon dioxide you're uh, releasing. It can yeah. judge your size. So, if you two went out together and the tick sense both of you, oh, it's... that's a dinner menu. You can actually pick which one it would go for based on your smell, your blood type, all these yeah. things that would go into it. You yeah, probably yeah. wait for him. He's going to live longer. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I can run faster. <laughs> yeah. No, but, yeah, but it for, is... our, for our listeners, Al, because I was doing a bit of research since you, you told us at the Stalking Show, a tick isn't just a tick. You know, I, I learned that actually a tick goes through a three-stage life cycle Correct. where Correct. you have the larvae, the nymphs, and then the adults. But which is the, how would you class it, the most dangerous part of the life cycle for us as a, you know. The nymphs. The nymphs. The poppy seed nymphs. The second stage is the most dangerous. The little tiny um, one. The tiny one. Yeah, that's the People one always pick, Yeah, and, and that's the one that carries uh, boreal bacteria the most than, um, than the adults. The adults, uh, you have to understand, one, one thing I can tell you uh, is, is how, because people assume they're insects, like midges, you know, they come in a May, June time and disappear by October. Yeah. That's not the case. Ticks are extremely long lived. Some yeah. of them are up to three years old. Really well. You know, yeah. they know your patch better than you do. They've spent the yeah, last yeah, three yeah. years. Yeah, yeah. So they're, they're well versed. And uh, But the most dangerous stage in a life cycle, they start small, obviously, on rodents, small birds, etc., and they progress through larger mammals. And when we get to the deer stage, now we're talking about the female tick getting ready to make eggs you know two to three thousand eggs require a lot of protein that's yeah. where deer come into it because they provide that final stage the final juice required for yeah. the female to get a good meal uh, and crack on with her business um and, and that's where humans as well um so vectors are key in the life cycle but yeah nymphs are where the business end is in terms of lime uh, they're the hardest to see mm -hmm. uh, and they feed a lot uh, as a result of they need to get to a decent stage and the extreme feeders uh, and, and ticks supplement that blood. So the, the tick story cannot exist without deers. And we have a significant number of deers um, currently than we did 100 years ago, per se. So that's another topic on its own in terms of why are we suffering from high tick burdens and uh, why is Lyme on the rise? And I think it's to do with afforestation, post-war, more deer now, even additional species of deer, you know, now we have Munchak, Chinese water deer, that is also feeding into the system. Um, and more people are spending more time outdoors since COVID. You know, people have learned, you know, the outdoors are great. Um, yeah, also the sheep dip that they used to use that was pretty, um, 
poor on the environment and on everything else, that, that's also a ban now. So perhaps the uh, insecticides that we use to combat them, um, you know, in the yeah. seventh last century, um, they're not available anymore. So perhaps the uh, you know, tick burden on sheep's higher and everything. But uh, that's exactly right. I mean, I, I went to visit a, a conservation site in Durham. I was invited to for a, for an article, I think, um, and I was surprised to hear they have no. They don't. They rarely see ticks up there, despite the area look like ideal for it, mm-hmm. uh, and was the result of uh, heavy ship dipping of the past. Yeah, that's completely eradicated the area. Although they don't use it anymore, yeah. But uh, you could, the population's dwindled to such a state that's never recovered. You know. No. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a multitude of. Obviously, we have wetter winters, dry summers. We travel more. Animal products cross nations you know people are driving flying just getting a to b is much easier than it used to be and there's more people now than ever i'm super aware of ticks when i'm i hate them and i've had lots of them um and i'm a bit paranoid about it you know what i mean and um and we also get flat flies on our reds as well that sometimes get off them and you get them in your hair you know what i mean it's like yeah well uh, not all of us get in our hair (laughs) (laughs) you might get them here but um my (laughs) I think once I've left the forest, I kind of forget about it. And it, say we're away for two or three days, we've got a few carcasses hanging up. And then it's that, you know, final morning, client's gone, it, it, game dealers come in, or we're moving our carcasses. And I, and I wear a glove. I wear gloves when I handle carcasses, uh, just as best practice, really. But I think that's when I get them. I think that they cut, they've, they've realised that, the you know, the hosts now got no purpose to them whatsoever it's look you know the aliens looking for um correct uh, a, a hot fat lad to eat off and i'm <laughs> eating, and, and that's how i get them and then it's like the next day when i've had shower or whatever and i had one you know probably a month ago and it was right under my watch strap and it gone right under my watch strap and it and i was like it started itching and there's this blooming little little nymph tick stuck into yeah. me so i think my own i'm really sensitive about when i'm grolicking and uh, it's why i've kind of favor the suspended grolic so you're not kind of leaning all over it you know what i mean but yeah. um i think i switch off to it once i get to the larder and it's where i really need to have a bit more um it's funny you say that yeah because um the only people that say that are professionals those going through significant numbers of carcasses <laughs> See, the average Joe, you know, part-time stalker, I'm moving away from the term recreational stalker, that's wrong, yeah. part-time stalker, uh, as a full-time professional that say that because because there's a lot of uh, animals in the larder that you have to process on a regular basis. And I have, I've got a mate in uh, Isle of Skye who said the same thing. Yeah. Mo- like Just like he said, almost 90% of the time that he gets them is when he goes into the larder, opens the freezer or something like that. That's that's when it gets him. And uh, you have to understand that's, that's, that's quite, makes sense. it makes sense to me because if you've been at four degrees for a deer yeah. trapped in there, not because you chose to be there, you're just trapped in there with a the carcass, right? For two, three days or a week, whatever. And Owen goes and opens that, that fridge. You know, you're looking at from four degrees to a toasty 37. That's a 33 degree improvement and imagine this sensor yeah. is not going to miss that it's a wonder i can't hear i'm going <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to miss it's going to lock onto it fairly quickly versus if you're outdoors on a summer day yeah. and the temperature differential was let's say five six degrees that's yeah. less it's harder to detect than from three degrees to 37 that's a big you know it's, it's a hot pie uh, yeah, just in front yeah. of you you're just going to jump on it, aren't you yeah yeah but they don't jump no, <laughs> no. D- despite what people believe, I mean, they do kind of sense the kind of top, top of the grass, filling out the air. But you know, they, they do not jump. They're not springy. They're not like a, a fleece. You know, they're, they're quite a spidery type. Um, they are spiders, and that's the subspecies. That's the kind of family of animals they're in, uh, which are literally designed for resilience, intelligence, and extreme predatory kind of qualities to them, uh, which spiders absolutely possess. I sometimes think if my dog, you know, because we, we've got a Bavarian that we work and if she, when she's out in the woods, you know, during the daytime, if we're doing odds and sods and that, she'll be out with us. And I, I sometimes wonder if Lola picks them up mm. and then brings them back into the car, and you know what I mean? And they don't necessarily bind to her, but they're in the vehicle and, you know, you've, you've hung your jacket over the back of your car and all that. So yeah. 
I'm blaming it on the dog. You, you, you need separate cars. I had a mate who came to visit me in Northumberland uh, about four years ago. He had a black lab on him, and uh, we literally went and stopped for about two or three hours. I mean, we had maybe three carcasses on, on the deck. Um, he sent me a picture when he went home. I think he must have pulled about 25 ticks from one animal and uh, just in a three-hour session. So, so sometimes you just have to hit the worst patch, that dump, mossy place where humans haven't stepped in for a good couple of years. And you just you can, you can feel it when you disturb that environment. And clear fell is boggy, as you know. There's no solid ground under your shoe, under your boots. It's quite soft and spongy. And that's literally the environment they spent 100 million years in. They've really worked out this dump, dark forestry environment, which this island is just perfect for them. Um, yeah, this is quite um, to a point where I only take my dog in particular grounds in particular time of the year. Uh, forestry block is really not, and, I've, uh, and I used to stalk with a uh, with kind of wolf-looking Alaskan Malamute, a snow dog. She's old now, but you know it's a very fluffy thing, and I'd, I can't go through combing through that. It's not even as easy as a spaniel or a, or a Labrador. So uh, sometimes you have to be careful, and like you say. People drop carcasses and vehicles they use for the family, school drop-offs, etc. Um, you know, every time a carcass goes inside a vehicle, don't forget, it is looking for the nearest hot thing. And it will abandon the carcass and move forward to new pastures. And uh, so I use a, a box, like a toy box. If the carcass goes in, it's nicely sealed inside the vehicle. I have a pickup that I don't use for anything else. But even then, you just have to make sure they're sealed. In the summer, you, know, you can have one of those... Um, muslin sheet kind of bags you know to protect the flies anyway that contains them but the idea that an animal sometimes i see it on, on social media where people carrying this car you know two carcasses etc you know in direct link with their neck uh and it's just oh, uh, no, yeah. it's, it's bizarre i know it looks cool and all but i think mm-hmm. uh people have to be very serious on how they conduct themselves around Absolutely. an animal in some cases could have two three dozens uh looking for an alternative source so i mean you know the, the good the standard operating procedure is quite clear you know wear gloves even long sleeve uh she sometimes that really helps like i say um 90 percent of contacts usually are on this part of your body and in, in, in your hands um and under your near you know your lower limbs is where entry point for most ticks so we're wearing any protection that would help um during carcass handling and transport and also how you ladder them I, I, I think you'll be okay but you must be switched on at all times and check yourself regularly i mean uh, people always tell me how, where they're surprised even those who think they're really switched on by this four or five days later you get that itch that ne- that comes after four days and uh, i mean i've had one between my uh, my right fingers you know in between the digits i i, I was typing away for days never paid attention to it yeah, wow. And then oh, I, was... I, 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 I could tell you some stories of mates who've had ticks in places and we can't even discuss it, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> oh, but I, I know exactly what you mean. Well, uh, if you think of it, the, the, in, on a deer, they'll go for the groin, won't they? You know what I mean? So, yeah. um, but, and, and I was, while you were just talking, I was thinking, you know, we, we shoot reds up in Staffordshire and, and, and we get heavy tick burden on those, but they're in farmland against, um, you know, with, with sheep and cattle and stuff like that. So they're kind of, they're all helping each other. But one of the things I always see is I never, ever hardly see a tick on a muntjac. No. They are so clean. They're, they're is it called, they're in the, inside the legs of the withers or whatever they're called. It, it, they're always that lovely white colour, maybe one tick once in a while. But in general, it's immaculate. And I wonder if they're more prone to, because they've got um they come from a, a more jungle environment where those kind of um, uh, um insects and problems would have occurred you know hundreds of years ago when that when that's where they were originally from if they've got something inbuilt in them that they won't let anything stay on them and they pull it out and you know they get rid of it like that well, have well, you got any thoughts on that Al? maybe uh, 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 pruning Possibly. I mean, uh, the two things really, usually with biology, the two things that will drive such a thing. Uh, the first thing is, um, once you accept the fact that ticks aren't stupid, they've spent 100 million years literally perfecting this weapon, obviously they would have targeted it to something. Uh, yeah. So it's not the weapon that could be easily switched on. It's not a, an all-out war. It is specific. It's a specialist mm-hmm. killer in, in a way. So it's honed, onto his, <laughs> it's honed onto his spray. So Munjak might not be it. 
possibly Munjak has its own physiology as well. Yeah. It's new. It's a newcomer to this island. It's hot, it's scent, body size, heat generation, and the behavior are completely different to what ticks have evolved to yeah. latch onto. Uh, and anybody who's ever opened Munjak would attest to the thickness of that skin. Yeah. Um, it is not the softest thing to get into. No, no. Uh, and don't forget, ticks are quite tough. But even they have their limits. So I think it has something to do with an interplay between those and also this uh, shearing mechanism they have at the front. Uh, my struggle to go through... My, every time I open a munjack, I'm surprised. Yeah. Oh, my, I pass my knife dull, you know, because I'm used to row. It just goes like... Uh, yeah. So I, I think it's a combination of being a new boy on the island mm. and the thickness of the skin, probably. Yeah, no, it's, it's interesting. It? it is interesting. And... and, and um, I did butt in earlier on and said um, Clapham Common, but you did tell us a story about where the um, where the high 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 are higher tick densities and the other. So in the Midlands, as far as I'm aware, and if there's any listeners who uh, disagree, drop us a message. But in, in the Midlands and certainly down through the Cotswolds, we don't get so yeah, you know, we get occasional ticks if you know what I mean. But then if you get sort of like down into um, Southern Oxfordshire, Buckinghamshire, moving down into Hampshire and like that, you see the further south we seem to go. Um, I've got a mate who's a, a commission ranger down in the south and some of his woodlands, uh, you know, he tells us some of the stories. He, he, he's, he's got to constantly be aware of, uh, of the, the ticks on him. And, and you were talking about carcass, uh, handling the carcasses. The carcass trays he's got, he can get three or four row in there. He only shoots row uh, and he's got a lid on it. You know what I mean? So it literally goes, anything goes in, lid back on it, off to the larder at the end of the stalk and everything goes down and cleaned out. So that's that would probably come under their, um, you know, their their risk assessment of handling carcasses with, which have a uh, high tick um, proportion on them. No, correct. I mean, it's, um, it's basically it's those individuals living in Clapham Common, but they spend enough time in Green Park. So the that, site is Green Park. It's London. Green Park, that was it. Yeah. <laughs> But they do live in Clapham Common. They just spend time in Green Park. But I think what's happened is uh, essentially you wouldn't think Green Park should have one of the highest levels of Lyme disease uh, compared to the rest of the country. Um, and the reason is simply uh, a lot of affluent Londoners own second homes in the in Scotland and the Highlands, where they spend a lot of time in Scotland uh, with their dogs, um, and those. Uh, and they go back to London. And when they go to London, there's only a small green patch where they can exercise the dogs and themselves. So yeah. all these affluent individuals who spend a significant amount of time in Scotland congregate in this tiny little two, three mile, whatever the size is, of Green Park. Uh, and obviously the ticks are going through the cycles of feeding and falling off, feeding and falling off, etc. So what you have is a, a melting pot of the different ticks from across the country melted down to a two mile radius switching between dogs, people, and deer, whatever is nearby. Um, and so the way to look at it is, um, in most areas, you need to be bitten by about 100 ticks, and about three to four of them will be carrying this bacteria with the likelihood of you getting Lyme. Uh, areas like Green Park register up to 30%. Really? So really, one and three, one and four <laughs> is it. Really? So that, that's the reduction in terms of the, the, your chance of not... I mean, it's quite a dangerous proportion. How many yes. times you have to be bitten to get Lyme in Green Park versus a country that, you know, a country, somewhere in the countryside, even with a lot of deer, where your chances are, you know, three, four out of 100. So that, that's, a, that, that's to do with travel, changing the environment and how we're using, how a lot of people can go to, you know, very high tick burden areas and can go back and congregate even into a smaller pool of land where that swap is quite acute. Um, and so, yes, yeah, bizarre. And, and Lyme disease, in many ways, in fact, I believe it's the only disease that primarily affects uh, affluent people. Most diseases in the world affect poor people. Uh, Lyme disease actually is the disease of the rich uh, because it's to do with your lifestyle and where you live. Um, and there are many illnesses. That I'm pretty sure Lyme disease is the only one that's attributed yeah. to being an and now, it, 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 We've been talking about the tick and uh, and that and, and now we've moved on to Lyme's disease. Um, you know, there's there's a lot there's a lot out there to read about it and and, 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 and but just for the listeners, you've been bitten by a tick, you've pulled it out, or you put toothpaste on it and it's dropped off after two days. 
which nobody's going to do after this podcast, <laughs> clearly. Yes. That was, listeners, that was my tip to Al, because I was told that years ago by an old stalker, and that's what I've always done. But apparently it's the worst thing I could have done. But uh, anyway, so you... And then you get this... Uh, a few days later, you start to get this uh, ring around it, don't you? I've never had it touch wood, not that I've seen or done and everything... But all is not lost then. If you recognise that and you get yourself some medical help, you can get on a course of strong antibiotics and it, it can it can it can turn that around, can't it? Correct. Uh, and uh, and the reason you shouldn't interfere with, it, with the animal once you see it is because the majority of, in fact, all the infection comes from the animal regurgitating its inside contents onto you. So when an animal attaches, it's nice and peaceful. Nothing's happening. It's just feeding away. Everything's nice and dandy. The minute you start putting toothpaste or salt behind it, then that uncoiling process has to immediately take effect. And what happens is it will regurgitate during feeding. And because the bacteria is in its gut, it crosses the barrier because the minute it sticks into you, there is a syringe connecting you to the animal's gut. So if the animal naturally drops off on its own accord, then that process is significantly limited. Whereas if you rush it by shooting the animal that's on, or by putting toothpaste on it, it will uncoil mid-phase and it will regurgitate. That's where the infection comes from. How do you remove your ticks, or do you just let them enjoy themselves for a few weeks until they drop off? Uh, so for the removal, uh, the NHS guidelines are correct. Uh, you should use a specialist tick remover. You can yep. buy them on eBay, Amazon. They come in different stages, covering the nymph, the adult. Some of them are American, so they have very large varieties as well. Uh, but use a professional kit that is made for the purpose of not forceps, not anything, anything domestic uh, yeah, not, not that you can use. something like yeah, that. No, yeah, no, no, di- no DIY. But the tool we've got is like a credit card with a slit in it. Yes. Yeah, there are different uh, varieties. Of various sizes. It's got two, you yeah. know what I mean? That's, that's but it needs do. to be made to remove ticks. So mm-hmm. any tool or device that is suboptimal is only going to trigger that regurgitation process. And you do not want that. It is better to let it feed and fall off than to mess with it halfway through the process in terms of infection. So yeah, use a professional kit from Amazon, eBay, buy it online, but literally twist it uh, as per guideline and uncoil. So the, when it bites into you, um, the front end has a very particular uh, waves and the way it gets into you. So it needs to be taken out. Uh, it's, it's like taking a corkscrew, you know, it has to go in and come out in a particular way. So don't force, that does what those kits are supposed to do is to naturally bring that to order so when it comes out it comes out exactly the way it went in not snap the opposite direction in which case what that's what you find mouse part being dislodged or snapped in half uh, so the kits are designed to orientate the animal during exit in the same way that it went in because the human skin is quite tough i know it doesn't look of it's quite tough from that perspective it's a tiny animal don't forget so any pressure anything that's going to snap that syringe that is connecting you to its gut uh, that that's where the weak point is, and that and that you should definitely any stalker, hiker, anyone who spends time outdoors, should definitely. My rifle bag has a compartment, um, and uh, we can go through first aid of a deer stalker. That's another topic, <laughs> but essentially, uh, if you had a minimal kit for first aid, the only three things you should have as a deer stalker uh, is a tick removal kit. Uh, the next one is a, an Israeli army type bandage. Uh, and a wound sealing powder. Those are the three things that a deer stalker should have. Uh, literally, it's a, a tourniquet type um, bandage, any army type will do, um, and a, a wound sealing patch, uh, powder. Those are the three things that would really save a deer stalker. And I've had people who come in with first aid kit and I've opened their first aid kit from boots. On I could find it was a tiny scissor, a pair of scissors, plaster, I'm not saying they're not important, but you know when you're deer stalking, we're dealing with serious things, and we have higher caliber rifles. Uh, with the exception of heart attacks and those serious business, there's not really much you can do out there that would really make it. You know, anything that you can use a boots head bag, I can definitely bring you back to the vehicle and sort that out. So the bit that you don't have time for, uh, or you know, removing ticks as soon as you see them is key. You know, the first 24 hours are almost safe. Uh, the longer they stay, the uh, probability of you being infected is quite high so getting onto them early and removing them so if you're on the field for a weekend sometimes i'm away in the woods for a weekend i don't come out you know i can go there friday night and don't come out until sunday so uh so my rifle kit literally has a tick removal kit uh, an israeli army type bandage tourniquet 
and a wound sealing powder for obvious reasons. But I think those are the three. Uh, Deer Stalker's first aid kit has to be really as basic as that, um, uh, apart from obviously your lawn working equipment, uh, you know, yeah, heart, yeah, yeah. heart attacks and all that. But most times there's not much you can do about them anyway. So. But before they even get to your skin, there are preventive measures that you can take as well, isn't there? In terms Correct. of clothing. Well, since I've started, I mean, I've been wearing gloves for probably the last 10, 15 years, you know, uh, nitrile gloves. And I, I think that's really helped the, the initial bit that you contact with. And it's also not that I had lots of cuts, but just small, you know, when you perhaps just touch your rib, if you've sawed through it or something like that, and you get a little scrape, I've, it's stopped a lot of that now. You know what I mean? That uh, just wearing those gloves uh, mm. and I use them all the time. I use them on, you know, and I'm doing odd jobs now. I, I, I wear these uh, the rubber gloves and the uh, Mickey who helps us has just got these orange gloves and they're like, um, they're like a glove and a half. They're slightly thicker. And yeah. uh, you can, re- <laughs> not that I'm tight, but you can actually wash them out and reuse them again. You know I mean? You're a full timer, so you need to cut corners when yeah, you can. And, and, and yeah, being so. orange, you can actually see, I'm not that I've ever seen a tick on them, but you will be able to see better than the black ones I've used previously. You know, um, correct. Gloves, gloves has been probably the best improvement on, uh, on, on carcass prep, um, you know, nicks and cuts and stuff like that um especially when you're doing a few carcasses in the winter you know um i agree yeah it's it's, a, it's, it's it's like caliber you know they say it's the caliber of the man that matters not the color of the gun ticks are the same if you're out at the wrong time of day wrong place unaware of where you're trolling through then you you already set yourself up yeah. kit will help you but the, the primary thing is to know tick season life cycles where they're most likely to be and how to handle carcasses, etc. If, you, if you've if you've got this drilled in, that's why I'm very keen to get young people to really get into an SOP mm-hmm. on how to deal with it. Once you've ingrained into a young person, they'll never forget it and they'll stick to it. Yeah, I think uh, generations coming through are a lot more informed now. There's so much more information out there. And correct. You know, people, yeah. I, uh, I if you go on. another myth that I kind of only but a few years ago thought was a, a marketing gimmick was this idea that you can wear clothing that you know, kind of repels ticks. Yeah. But actually, like, for example, Robbins, you know, most people have probably heard of the brand. Yeah. And I actually did some digging on the science about it. And actually, they treat their clothing with a, a chemical substance called permethrin. Isn't Correct. that right? Correct. It's so, not just those. It is It is mixed with a polymer. Uh, permethrin it, on that, its own will wash off. Is that yeah. from the same line as oil of pyrethrum? Oh. I be, I'm not sure, possibly. Uh, I don't I actually to, know the source Years ago, we used to... Um, always, that's my favourite word, isn't it? Years <laughs> ago. We bought, used to get off a guy, Starky Sharp Knives, and he used to sell... Oh, God, I hope I don't send him to prison for this. He used to sell um, a spray called Bug Out. Yeah. It was oil of pyrethrum, um, a, a solution of that. And it was absolutely fantastic. And you used to just spray it around the bottoms of your trousers. Yeah, that would like be that. a permethrin variety, yeah. And then um, he didn't have it the one year. And he said, oh, they've stopped me having it because um, I import it. And all the – oh, God. I, I, have, I have to be careful on a podcast what I'm saying, don't I? But basically, he hadn't got – it was approved in the countries it was for sale in, but it hasn't been approved here. And if he wanted to get it approved chemically um, with the kite mark on it for the UK or whatever it was, he had to put it through a series of tests. And he said, for what I sell, it just isn't worth it. very expensive. Yeah. Six-digit figures normally for this. Yeah, thing. really. But yeah. it was bloody awesome. And then that came and went, and we couldn't use that anymore. You know what I mean? It, it, it's, no. um, I know, you know a lot of stalkers use DEET, don't they? Yeah, but the, le- the DEET in- goes in certain levels, I think. And, you know, again, years ago, we used to put stuff on. You could almost feel it burning your skin. <laughs> yeah. uh, and this is toxic. Uh, it's one of the yeah. reasons why uh, EU and UK are moving away from it. Uh, yeah. So the so the permethrin, as a pure chemical, as um, like you say, you can't keep it on your clothes. It will wash off. Uh, now, Robins, I have tested Robins gear before. Uh, they've sent me that kit. Um, uh, it's good for about 70 or 80 washers. Now, people always say, like, how can it last 80 hot washes? Uh, you know, you couldn't put anything on. It will normally will wash off. Uh, it's because it's mixed with a polymer, and that's part of the intellectual property, etc. It is part of, a, I think, German army definitely uses it. All German army uniforms are of the same fabric. 
Uh, it's been around in the late 80s. I think there was an episode on uh, field sports as well. Um, so fairly used, been tested, and you can go out and see it. You know, it definitely it does interfere with the ticks. Um, it's definitely, uh, you know, it's one of the things I would recommend to people. Uh, it does work, but you have to use it um, appropriately. I mean, it does release uh, permethrin into your skin. Uh, but the selling point is, is the amount released over a course of a 24-hour period. That's what makes it dangerous. I would recommend you, know, you wear any sort of treated material 24-7 as pajamas. Uh, but for intended use, just like the German army, on how much a person will have on them, it is within the acceptable range. Uh, but most things, um, there's no safe, you know, every shampoo comes with hell's a warning these days. There's nothing that is, apart from water, there's nothing really... Everything has a some side effect, some but Robin's gear in particular, which is what's mostly traded here, um, does work, uh, particularly in summer terms. Uh, summer times, I find it. I, I'm still yet to be bitten by one while wearing Robin's, uh, and 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 is it? Uh, it's definitely proven. You, you, you can literally drag it. You can put Robin's gear, drag it through grass, um, and, and you can see the outcome fairly straight away. So that's a self uh, kind of. You can prove it yourself. You don't need any data. You can literally drag your gear yeah. outdoors. I was interested to understand actually what it did and actually what, what it does is cause a, a hot feet effect. So yeah, I so it interferes it. with the nervous system. So they, they it's almost like they're walking on a hot pan. Um, yeah. So there's a few videos of it online you can check out. So the 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 permethrin with polymer interfering with the ticks is quite straightforward. Mm. Um, and like I say, 80 washes, I don't know about you, but I'm not a big fan of washing field clothes regularly. Uh, unless she tells me I stink, I really wash them, you know. <laughs> when when it puts it, when the tick, let me get this right. When the tick puts its feet on Ravinci clothes, and yeah. it makes its feet dance around. Yeah, there's a little dance, little like, jig. I got like Michael Jackson and Billy <laughs> Jean. <laughs> <Ow>! <laughs> That's what you get. <laughs> need, to, need, to, need to get the microscope out. So to the old boys who oh, had the uh, tick, ticks in uh, strange just, places, all you have to do is wear... Um, Revenge underwear. You know, yeah, permethrin uh, thongs or I've, underwear. Or I've, some sort. I've uh, had a set for quite a few years. Darren Bullock, when he first started Darren, working with them, uh, sent me a set and I wore them for probably two or three years, but then other kit arrives and other things come along. So it's kind of... Um, isn't the first thing I reach for, but I've definitely still got a set. They still haven't had 70 or 80 watches. And if I was ever going to go back up into Scotland, where we yeah. used to start, start stalk seeker on Kintyre, the ticks up there were flipping ticks on ticks. You know, it was, yeah, um, it, was it was high up there. Yeah. But, uh, but I, I, have we not talked the tick thing to death? <laughs> right, this, I think <laughs> what you, the information you've given us uh, has been fantastic. And uh, it's Good. after hearing it for the second time, I feel a lot better educated on it. And I hope the uh, this we have, um, uh, have, have, have enjoyed that knowledge that you've given in a very understandable way. And um, ticks are here to stay, unfortunately, aren't they? Especially with our... Uh, you know, Absolutely. The, uh, yeah. I mean, look, I mean, we're... I think the biggest takeaway for me is the fact that a tick isn't just a tick. A lot of the time... It's a dancing tick. You'll check yourself over, there's nothing there. Because actually... There's a nymph. There's probably nymphs present, but just because they're so small, you can't see them. That's why a lot of time the people pick them up, two, three, you know, a week, two later, yeah. where they've actually been present on your skin, had time or to feed. Then they've actually got to a size where you actually see them. I, I, I'm just thinking of our, our housekeeping of carcasses into the back of a car. My boots are off. They're in the back next to it. The carcass is going cold. My mm. boots are still warm. Then I put them back on. It's just, there's loads of things you could actually look at it that we could do do better mm. um, to avoid avoid it. And I think this conversation has been really helpful. But I want to move on slightly now because um, I'm going to read from Nota Maid. Al has made it his mission to introduce as many women to deer stalking as he can. I think that's fantastic, Alan. How's that going? Are you uh, what? What's the head count on how many women you've taken out now? Oh god, I, I've lost count. I think the last count was about one seven five, would just shy off about one eighty. Honestly, wow. are you a hero? Yeah. But it's been a long time. It's been nearly uh, ten, eleven years. Um, I know. I, I I enjoy having um, female stalkers out. They always zero well. They always listen. Not that I'm incredibly, they are upset the all our client stalkers now. But um, but no, they they've they've got no ego. They've got nothing to prove. You know, and they all they always listen. Uh, easy to guide. You know, they're, um, yeah, I, I, I must admit I've enjoyed it. And especially if it's one of them's first 
trip out to get a deer. Um, Correct. Yeah. yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it's because you are part of that experience, aren't you? It's, it's, the, it's the first skill, it's the first shot, and it's a memory shared. You know, you'll forget what comes afterwards, but the first one you do tend to remember. Yeah, so yeah, you're also being part of their experience, you know, so that, that has value, I think. I know what you mean. Yeah, and I I, I think um, they're, yeah, they're, they, mop it up and they, they listen to what you do and i say it's especially if they've generally uh, generally they've shot game you know um my mate's daughter is probably a good example she, you know shoots sh- shoot shotguns and everything and she really wanted to go out and try stalking with us and was you know really interested in everything we did coached her through it and um shoots really well now you know what i mean we know no ego you know just does the job bosh and um she's only a you know young girl hopefully we're going to get her out for a robot this summer but um yeah it's it would be great to and i think there is you know just if you just go on to instagram and the likes that the amount of young ladies or yeah ladies that uh, you know like. trying it out you know um and and, uh, and putting up positive posts about it you know it, it's but it helps when there's like groups like um, Artemis Deer Stalking that's like exclusively exclusively for girls that yeah they have, they have their own community and they felt represent you know they feel represented yeah and and I think with deer stalking you go you go away with so much more than say a day's game shooting mm. I'm going to start like I'm always moaning about game shooting but if you know you're out at first light it isn't just about deer you see a lot more of nature your bird song all all those wonderful things that give you that lovely outing and then if at the end of it you've got a um, you know a carcass that you can take back and um you know it fills your freezer then that's a bonus as well isn't it you know mm. it is, yeah i mean it's um deer stalking it shouldn't be but unfortunately it, it is a kind of an elite part of shooting it's just getting to it is not easy rifles are obviously for obvious reasons heavily controlled and how they all you, can't, you couldn't borrow right you could borrow a shotgun you can't borrow a rifle uh you know anything surrounding a deer worthy caliber is uh, a deer caliber basically it's quite complicated uh, and most people don't have access to even if they had a rifle most people don't have access to a ground where they could take a person or ex- it's just it's far more complicated than game shooting so any opportunity can offer newcomers of all ages um you know from different walks of life uh you, you don't have to become deer stalkers at the end even if they have good positive experience of deer stalking um it's, it's a good battle to have as you know shooting community is always fighting to justify what we do um and half the population as i always say are women and they also half of the voters you know so anything that would give shooting deer stalking a positive experience because at the end of the day there is venison to go to the kitchen all the families can say oh what did you do today oh i went for my first stalk here's this venison you know all those things are good positive long-term winners and we're not very good at usually looking the next looking out to the next 15 20 30 years but every shooting person genuinely whether you're a deer stalker game shot you must really factor in the next 30 years and how you would want this sport to survive and every little thing we do individually today making sure a family enjoys uh, you know a portion of venison to have really good experience about deer management incrementally it all adds to future voters and when it comes down to it so i think we are responsible we by default ambassadors every day every person you take out don't forget they'll tell their kids their parents you're just recruiting you know it's a lot hanging fruit but we, sometimes i do run into people who are often very short-sighted about what we do it's just about the now and the season and the cull bag uh, i think there's far more to it you know we get to enjoy this because some people have done really hard work pride and we all stand on the shoulder of giants you know so you must do enough for the future so you know if you're not recruiting at least giving the opportunity to one two individuals a year i'm sorry to say but you are failing as as a as a community member because it's not just about your enjoyment it'd be easy if it was just you but we've now come to a stage in our lives and society that we must explain what we do we must put a positive spin which it is you know on everything we do and the conservation element to it and that's really a, a daily job i mean there's never a day where you go out with a rifle where that isn't the job um that's my no, overall view at least and and we've um we've recently this year brought out a newsletter um well dan's championed it a bit and it was i, I kind of i didn't greet it with the enthusiasm that i perhaps should have done and uh, in hindsight i was wrong now 
Uh, not very often I say that. <laughs> uh, and, um, and what we've done is done like a monthly newsletter that people subscribe to. And then we, we just write a, a little bit down about our diary, so what we're doing and everything. And and we've kind of changed how we uh, um, communicate really with on our social media. We're trying to, and for people that have followed us for years and see what we do, um, we perhaps apologise for you perhaps thinking we're stating the obvious, but there's a lot of our Q&A and, and the queries we get are from people that don't know things that you naturally, if you've done it for five, ten years and, you know, worked with one species or anything like that, that you assume that people know that and they don't necessarily know that. So we mm. kind of, we say what you should look out for this time of the year, what we're doing, what works for us. And um, I've always been keen to do that and just kind of say, well, this is what we do. I've been doing it for quite a while. This is what works for us in in the areas that we're in. It might not work for you. You know, um, I've, I've had guys going, oh, well, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm feeding beans like you do up in the borders to road here in the middle of a commercial forest and they're not eating them. Oh, they wouldn't have a clue what they were. You know what I mean? <laughs> so it's a little bit, I'm trying to give a bit of what we've done over the years back and, and it's, it's been very well received and, um, and anybody that's listening, I would urge you to subscribe to it. So, uh, but that's kind of what we try and do. And um, we obviously have clients, but clients that come along and they bring the, the you know, the, um, children with them as in you know teenage guys and everything that come along on and accompany us on it and uh one of the lads that helps us he's got a daughter she can only be 10 or 11 he's got her out air rifle shooting squirrels and stuff like that on one of our permissions and um i i totally agree with you it's um to get the youngsters involved and you know spread that mm. love that we've got um for the great outdoors and the management of it um, Absolutely, and that's yeah. the real thing. Key, I think, I think for too long now that our industry has been kind of had this cloak of secrecy. I think we're trying to approach it to become more and more transparent and kind of come across in more of an educational uh, way in which I approach it in that people that come into see our content for the first time perhaps aren't deer stalkers, but maybe are someone who's interested in ecology and just kind of found themselves in you know on our on our page through mm. i don't know having a yeah I don't know, something to do with deer management and i think we have to approach it like that where we are transparent educate people uh, and um and are and willing and willing to answer questions yeah. you know difficult questions about what we do you know it's everybody knows that our deer populations are expanding rapidly no one really knows the true number that we've got people are happy to put figures to them but i've you know just we live in the midlands and we you know row are the last to get to us and we've now got road here and i never thought in my lifetime i'd have road here near my village and we've yeah. got road here near us now and it's you know you can see how the deer maps filled in and i've been going to deer meetings since the I mean, early 90s and there were you know the deer society were banging the table then and you know I was going on, I mean, I can remember going, 1994, I went on a, a seminar about Munchak across at the King's Forest, Norma Chapman, bless her, and they did this thing and they said, you need to shoot them on site. That was the Forest Commission, you need to shoot them on site. And they were so right, and we'd still have Munchak here today, um, and no one really took it up. And we're still saying, we've got to shoot more deer, we've got to shoot more deer, and I really don't know how we can make people realize that is you know what i mean in 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 certain areas you know there's i mean I've, this is a live story on one of the farms we've got in oxfordshire which is just north of oxford right there was a chinese water deer seen by the farmer who knows what a chinese water deer is right we've got road fallow and munchak on there and we keep on top of them and now wandering down the main drive last month chinese water deer that's cross the M40, and that's probably eight or ten miles into Oxfordshire. Yeah. I've never seen them this side at all. Um, so that's amazing, isn't it? I mean, the question is whether it's a, of a natural radial expansion like most animals do, or there's mm. a human element to it. Uh, this is a story I love to tell people um, about Munjack in the north of England and Scotland. So I have always, I was told by a local person, I've never forgotten what he told me. Uh, and I'll use, I always use it as my own line, but it's not my own line. But the history of the Munjak is, is of the history of the A1. Yeah, <laughs> it really yeah, is. Yeah. Uh, because you can almost dot 
where they've been dropped off a motorway because they used to be netted and that sort of thing. Uh, so the question is, did it okay, animals don't randomly end up in a habitat that doesn't suit them? So yeah. the radial natural expansion is easy to see because it will be happening like a, a wave. Mm. We all be seeing that wave approaching. When you get a solitary animal significantly away from the radial wave, then you have to question how did it get there? Because like I say, animals are quite habitual in what they yeah. do. Uh, and I suppose the one thing I wanted to add before, to your previous point was um, uh, nobody actually knows the exact number. I've done enough research on this. Nobody actually knows the exact number of deer in the UK. Um, and for most parts, uh, deer are actually well, well managed, uh, m vast majority of the country. There are areas and particular species of interest, depending on whether you're in Scotland or England. Uh, but we don't have a national deer problem. Um, we have very specialist, unique areas of, of significant interest, Munjak and Fallow mm -hmm. being one of them. Um, but the distribution is very unique. You know, in some areas where wherever you have a lot of professionals, it's well managed. When you go to lowland areas where commercially it might not be viable for contracts, for instance, yep. but you have part-time stalk, part stalkers like myself, um, then you tend to experience some population issues. Um, but it's not, uh, I think a lot of people feel the increase in numbers, uh, national and everywhere and equally, it's definitely not. Uh, things like you know Chinese water deer, well managed for the for the number they have, and they could potentially be exterminated in less than four weeks if all rifles was to be out. You know, it's a uh, it's a well niche contained population. Uh, whereas fallow munjack are a different story. But uh, the spread of deer in the UK is not uniform, and the problem isn't everywhere. Some areas are actually well managed. In some cases, have actually gone down. Uh, some species have actually gone down uh, through management, etc. Um, so that's the only picture I wanted to say. Um, mm -hmm. I, although the number, nobody knows the number. Uh, if you have, if you hear a lot of professionals and average it out, uh, there are areas of good management, uh, but there are areas, like you say, where fallow munjack particularly are involved, where it is of significant concern for yeah. the protection of woodland and heritage sites. Yeah. But do you not think it's important for our industry to know more accurate deer number? Deer numbers in the UK. I think it's this thing yeah. that we're always throw around this there's two million, around two million, two million, and I'm always questioning. Well, based on what? Based I, on I, what? I've it's called. I wrote an article. Look out of the air. Yeah, I wrote an article for Shooting Times a while back. I called significant, numerous professionals, well, you know, read in the area, trying to get where that that two million, where, where was the, where did that two million originate? You get it quoted on everything, government papers, white yeah. home office papers, policy papers, every committee, everyone has that two million as a reference. Newspapers, um, it's not a bad estimate, you know, you know, it's not blank. I mean, some educated guesses have gone into it. Um, but w after speaking to these numerous people, well in the know, uh, they all accept the fact that uh, the distribution map has been great. That's fairly as good as you're ever going to get it, really. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to the incidents, of how many are, uh, there's physically it's impossible to know for a shy woodland animal that is l not visible, only visible for about three hours of the day to get a, a population. And there are very clever scientists that are very good at population census by droppings, grazing, et cetera. There are ways of doing it. Um, so the, so that number, we will never know the exact number, but things are changing. I sat through a, a talk in Darlington, uh, north of England, where there was a Forestry Commission deer day. And there was a guy who had a company who uses drones, mm -hmm. uh, tri-camera drones that has uh, normal spectral vision, thermal, and uh, a kind of infrared, I think, or something, uh, but can detect uh, three different cameras, capture different elements you can almost zoom on to a you know seeker looking up or munjak looking up uh, and then this drone will map let's say you call them onto your ground they'll come and release these drones the drones will do their own thing and the computer software will register what it sees in real time so it can tell row from munjak to seeker and red so you get these dots uh, and so you can actually now we are now in a position to really tell at least for an area um, and these are large swathes of Scotland that have been done in such way by a couple of companies. Even research, I've sat through a few meetings where research has been commissioned for, for these private companies that operate these very expensive drones. Uh, mm. to, for the, so for the first time, I would say within the next five years, I think we will have a very good approximate number based on drone data. Uh, and don't forget, drones don't double count. The problem has always been with humans as you walk <laughs> along you know, animals are doing their own. So you can double yeah. count, triple count, yeah. or under count in some cases. Drones don't because of the speed they pass. 
uh, they'll just go ping, 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 and you know a deer won't circle back on them. Do you see what I mean? Because of the aerial view. So I'm absolutely certain after having chat with these people that are really clever and know what they're doing. Uh, within the next five years, I think the first real evidence-based number will crop up. So just wait and see, I think. But I think drones are definitely the one that's going to solve this problem because you can just send about 20 of them in a grid and you know they can do it all do day or night. For, do they work for in wooded areas as well? Uh, they do. Uh, so um, d you know, it doesn't matter what kind of canopy you have. There are times where the deer are not visible, but at some yeah. point they will be. But because the drones, I think they are, I don't fully know how they work, but I think they contracted for like a weekend. So the drones are there 24 seven for like over a number of days. Yes, so they'll yeah. catch them during feeding, mating, the whole life cycle. So the chance of you catching them. And plus, if you have things like fallow, you've got the family group moving, the herd moving. So it's not, it's very easy to trap in a certain area and get a good number fairly mm -hmm. quickly. A row could be challenging, munjak the same. But I think, um, but we don't have significant dense forests that will prevent such imaging over the course of days. So they do pop out now During and then. During the winter. Yeah, there are ways of getting around it. And I think, yeah, for lift drops in winter would be ideal. But I think all these numbers will be added up. And there are, I think, a lot of PhD students I've seen that are doing this kind of drone census in their studies. Uh, and if somebody, I think a BDS might have something like that, I'm not sure. I think there was, some, I read something about a thermal call. But I think a lot of people have really are investing in the usage of thermal drones for a population census. And in five years, Maybe that is that two million might be real, maybe underestimation, overestimation. But I don't think it will be significantly off, but you never know. You might, you might be surprised. Mm. Yeah, people should definitely stop quoting that two million, though. I think oh, that's. No. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, 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 best, it's best to say we don't know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, Al, I just want to say, I'm just looking at the clock. It's an hour and a quarter. Where's it gone? <laughs> I feel a lot better educated now. Sorry, I'm a chatterbox. <laughs> and I'm itching all over. But uh, <laughs> we really appreciate the time you've given us. And, and, um, uh, and the education that you've passed on to us and the uh, and the listeners and i hope they've enjoyed it as much as we have yeah. um any other questions for al no i just think and there's obviously in the podcast there's been some real key takeaways for not just novice deer stalkers but for those experienced as well you know some of the finer details of actually what the tick is and, yeah and i think it's, it's just in general for us it was about raising awareness constantly and just keeping it there in the forefront of conversation and, and and what you're doing will save lives. I mean, that's that's the joy of being in a platform that you are. Uh, although it's an enjoyable platform, we all listen to, you yeah. know, while we're out there or sort of reloading, whatever. Uh, yeah. But you will save lives. I mean, if you can capture even one individual who changes his hers SOP next week as a result of this, mm -hmm. you know, you're in the business of saving lives because informing yeah. is far more better than what a doctor there, would do. You know? Yeah, I don't uh, think we're a doctor yet, just yet. <laughs> Really, but yeah, you just have to capture people. We know you're a busy guy and we know you're uh, up in the north, but we uh, look forward to seeing you. Perhaps we'll see you around the game fair um, Definitely. Or, or, or next time you're down and about. But really appreciate it, Al. And, Thank you very uh, much. Thanks for having me, guys. No, it's, it's been it's been great. And um, yeah, uh, a, a real interesting conversation that I've thoroughly enjoyed and I appreciate that. And uh, I think I, I was thinking as you were talking, there's so, so much more. Mm. There's other things I've touched on, you know, <laughs> calibers that you shoot, you reload. And I think we're going to have to have you back in the autumn. We're going to have to have Al 2 Absolutely Gabriel, fine. the sequel. Yeah. The I think, sequel. I think I think we have to be back. a while we're out stalking now. Isn't yeah, <laughs> yeah. Gosh, yeah. get in you down, do a live one. Yeah, that was brilliant. But thanks ever so much, Al. We really appreciate thanks, guys. it. And all the best and good luck with your roadbook season. Uh, I know the rut's just around the corner, so I um, hope you're up in Northumberland and beep, 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 call your head off. And <laughs> the books come running better than they did last year for me. So uh, all the best. Take care. Thank you very much, Thank guys. Thanks for having me. Cheers. Cheers.